Hi everyone, this is Duncan from the podcast Under the Stairs. This particular video you're checking out just now has the archival recording attached to it. The archival recording is from our podography, I think that's the term that we use, um, and it will feature reviews of movies that fall under the 88 Films Italian Collection series. Now, the vast majority of reviews we've done over the last five years have been in audio format and published on our RSS feed for the podcast. We are transitioning over to give you access to all those reviews right here on YouTube under a playlist. Now, we're doing that because we're about to do our first video recording of E88 Films Italian collection release, that being Tentacles. So there's plenty of opportunity to delve into the back catalogue of the reviews here. And if you like what you hear, then please hit subscribe on the channel, leave your comments below, and uh, check out the rich catalogue of over 1,200 episodes we have on podcasts under the stairs on any podcatching device or Spotify that you use. So stick around, enjoy the episode, and I'll speak to you very soon. You're a good lay, like Colin said. A great lay. But my God, you don't think you're worth two million dollars, hmm? It's dirty money. Give it back. That's Enough. easy, Martini. If I want her, I'll take her. And there's not a goddamn thing you can do about it. Ah! Ah! Keep driving. We don't need company. Hey, what if those bills are marked? You're getting used to it, yeah? Does it disgust you anymore? I never said it disgusted me. I said it frightened me. Shut up! Ah! We God, send you back God. the first police car we meet, okay? No, come on, get in. We're heading for the highway going south. What's up, officer? Just routine. I'm an Italian journalist. My name is Mancini. Are you looking for someone? Let it pass, let it pass. There's no room. We'll end up in the canyon. Okay, Martini. Or whatever the hell you said your name was. The honeymoon's over. Well, what can I do against the one with the gun who was driving a white Pontiac? Good for you, Joker. I'm one of them. So now you know. You could have got us all killed. So what? When we've reached the Mexican border, when he doesn't need us anymore, he's gonna kill us anyway. Right, Connitz? Well, don't just stand there. Help him! You're mad, Connitz. You're sick. I feel sorry for you. You're all damn fags. You speak for your husband. Oh, no. You're included, too. What do you think you are? God's gift to us? You just use my body, right, Walter? And you make love with that gun, don't you? I bet every time you shoot, you feel more virile, more manly. Now I'll show you, reporter. I'm gonna give you a front row seat because I've got some unfinished business to take care of. And it's showtime. <laughs> Welcome back. So you've just heard the trailer for this disc number eight in our 88 Films Italian Collection review series. We're looking at Hitchhike. Oh, that's right. Hitchhike um, from 1977. Now, like a lot of these movies, it has other names. <laughs> so there's Auto Stop Rosso Sanguine, which is um, Italian for blood red hitchhiking. It's also known as Death Drive and The Naked Prey. And I think I may be right in saying this. Of all the movies we have discussed thus far in the collection, this is the first that, you know, you could maybe argue is not strictly a horror film. Yes, it contains those exploitative, kind of almost nasty grindhouse um, aesthetics in the story. Uh, I think of something like Last House on the Left, for example. Um which could maybe pivot it towards that genre 
I would say it's more kind of like a crime thriller with a little rape uh, spiced in here and there. Uh, if we jump onto the 88 Films website for their blurb on the release, it says, The late great David Hess, star of The Last House on the Left, took on one of his most maddening roles in 1977's seat-gripping grip, seat shocker, Hitchhike. Picked up at the side of the road by a bickering couple, essayed by the iconic Franco Nero from Django and ex-Bond girl uh, Corinne Selly from Moonraker, the seemingly good-natured Hess soon returns to his familiar screen ways as a sexually threatening psychopath. More than a few speed bumps follow and anyone seeking a gentle time in front of their television will, doubtlessly, be disappointed by the pedal to the metal menace and the Top Gear terror that this road trip into terror presents. A true standout of Italian suspense nastiness, complemented by a classic Ennio Morricone soundtrack, Hitchhike is brought to HD by a stunning new master, thanks to the sleeve-loving genre buffs at 88 Films. Now, the release itself, a bit light, um, unfortunately, on the old uh, special features. Um, this one has a montage reel of what would have been upcoming releases and uh, present releases on their slate in different uh, collections. So obviously, 88 Films has a slasher collection. Um, as well as some titles that they just put out themselves anyway. So it kind of covers some of them, some of the future Italian releases and stuff. But there's no, um, you know, director's commentary. There's no interviews with people from around the time. Um, you know, actors, actresses, or anyone involved with the project. So it's a bit light on that one. It does, however, have English subtitles, which is one of the first ones in the collection thus far to come out with subtitles, which... Um, I mean, for the most part, that there's a lot of dubbing on this one. Uh, just the nature of the beast when it comes to these sort of films. And the dubbing is actually pretty good in a lot of respects. Franco Nero at times looks like he's, he's, um, his dubbing's not necessarily synced up all that great. But for the most part, the rest of it works. Um, and I will say that the, the transfer of the film is pretty gorgeous, actually. The, it really kind of brings out the cinematography um, used at the time. So... Uh, let's take a very, very quick word to talk about the director of this movie, a little guy called Pasquale Festa Campanini. Um, once again, I'm fairly sure, fairly sure, I have butchered this man's name. Uh, he died in the 80s, actually. Uh, fairly young, he was only 58 years old. And was very active up until that point. I think it, like he's credited with about, I think it's maybe 30 plus movies against his name and was putting almost one to two movies out every year from about 65 onwards. This one, you know, comes out 1978 um, and the, the casting of the movie, specifically with Frank Nero, the two of them were, were very friendly with each other. Frank Nero himself had been working on a, another project which had a small bit part with David Hess and when this opportunity came up to do this particular movie he recommended Hess for the role I get the feeling I mean it, it seems like they just stumbled across that I think when you're writing a character the likes of Hess's character in this movie you know Hess is at the forefront purely because of the the kind of menace that the character has in Last House on the Left it's no you know how to put this it's, it's no coincidence that you know David Hess in the 70s is involved with a lot of little bits and bobs here um, kind of lean maybe more into the Krug character from Last House on the Left you've got to think of things like Hitchhike and even you know the house at the edge of the park infamous video nasty from 1980 where he kind of returns to his kind of rapey um, typecast which had appeared in, you know, a lot of them. And, I mean, I can understand that. I mean, Last House on the Left is such a prominent film in the genre. It really does kick off a whole series of um, rape revenge movies and movies with a very, very nasty tone in the 1970s. It really is at the forefront of that just because of how lurid and unlike anything else uh, that movie was at the time, you know, it really, really did kind of kick off. Now, Hitchhike is based loosely on The Violence and the Fury, a book by Peter Kane. Never read the book, so I don't know exactly where the, you know, the differences come in this one. Uh, and this was a first time watch for me as well, so I was, I was kind of eager to see 
where this one was going to go. I knew it was more a crime thriller than a horror movie. What I didn't realise when watching the movie is, well, until I started, that really there, this is one of these movies where there, in my opinion, there is no likeable character at all. Um, I think the, the closest we get to maybe a hero uh, or, you know, a protagonist in the movie is Col Corinne Celery's character. Um, she, for the most part, appears to be in a kind of loveless marriage with uh, Franco, Nero, Franco Nero's character. Um, he is a quote-unquote reporter sort of guy who has married into money. He's got a bit of a chip on his shoulder. He's Italian. Uh, she's American. And the, you know, she comes from a family with money. He does not. And there's a bit of a chip on his shoulder that, uh, you know, in conversations in the in the car with uh, Hess's character, he basically says, you know, people think if you marry the boss's daughter, then you're doing it to get ahead because you can't get ahead. You know, you're using your family's money like that or you know even if you're at your best um you've maybe got a leg up because of where you've married into or you get like an easier ride because you're part of the family i think that's quite an interesting sort of introduction this guy here the first time we meet him he is um he's hunting a deer and he puts his his wife in the scope for an unhealthy amount of time um, he's a bit of an alcoholic and we very very quickly see him for lack of a better word rape his wife um, now this is where the, the movie for them I, I mean I'll, I'll be upfront and honest I did really enjoy this movie but there, there are elements here that are way off piste in terms of where am I supposed to land here now I, I think what the movie is supposed to set up is this idea that that Hess and Nero's characters are very similar, you know, at, the, at their, their core. They're actually maybe mirror reflections on each other. Um, you know, Adam Kunst, is, uh, the character played by David Hess, is maybe slightly more psychotic, but, you know, the, the longer you spend with Nero's character, the more that you realise, actually, this guy is not nice, you know, he's not nice at all. He gropes, fondles his, his wife in the car and then, like I say, ultimately forces himself on her and she's not happy about it. Um, and later on at a campfire is supposedly telling jokes and one of his jokes is about, you know, what would have happened if he'd shot his wife and cooked her on a spit. Um, I'm fairly sure that didn't lose anything in the translation either between, you know, the, the Italian to English. It's just a weird sort of humour that this guy has that you're never entirely sure whether or not he's being serious or if he is actually joking. They of course pick up a hitchhiker um, and, and something that is a very much a shade of the hitcher in 86 but they pick up this hitchhiker played by David Hess um, and very very quickly realise that this guy is part of a team of four people that have robbed a bank. Uh, he has two million in his suitcase and he terrorises them along the road in various different uh, different ways. Um, at times he's very kind of hot and cold towards Nero's character. I think Nero thinks he can outsmart him as well so they, they make this arrangement that maybe he's going to write his story for him and this is going to be this great reporter story you know, on the road with this criminal, his, his backstory, his life. Meanwhile, Hess is paying a ridiculous amount of attention to Eve, played by Corinne Kelly, uh, Sally, sorry, and um, you know, ultimately tries to rape her at one point. Um, at this point, Hess is shot. Well, we think he's shot, and he dies. Once again, we think he dies at the hands of two of his his uh, bank robber buddies, who he has stolen the money from. These guys here are. Well, I think they've got the upper hand. They, you know, ultimately kidnap the, the married couple as well, uh, force them to try and take them to the the Mexican border. And we get a scene which, you know, is right out of Duel. If, if anyone wants to tell me that uh, Campanini didn't watch Duel, um, I would probably have to argue, because it very much is this menacing truck that doesn't appear to stop. It's trying to drive them off the road. Um, 
David Hess ultimately lures his friends, his, you know, back into a vehicle, kills them off, and then we're leading towards the end of this movie, which is uh, a scene where Nero himself is actually tied up by Hess and then has to sit and watch his wife being raped in front of him. Now, there's implications uh, in the way it's shot that maybe she likes what's happening to her. Um, and, I, you know, once again, it, it depends which point of view we're taking this from. Is this how Nero sees this going? Or is she actually enthralled uh, and, you know, pleasured and turned on by the violence that's happening here? We, we don't quite know. Um, Hess makes a big mistake. He obviously turns his back on... on um, Eve's character who goes and gets a rifle and shoots him. One of the more iconic kind of poster scenes for this movie is, you know, um, Corinne Celery's character standing fully nude with a large hunting rifle in her, her hand. So they, they kill Hess and then we're at this point still about 20 minutes away from the end of the movie and it sets up what will be the ultimate kind of ending to this movie of no one can track down what's happened to Hess's character there are no witnesses and we now have a suitcase containing two million dollars and it's um, Nero's opinion that they should keep the money um, Celery's opinion is that they should give it back or get rid of it because his money's you know not theirs and it's tainted and she's from wealth anyway but you know Nero's got this chip on his shoulder that you know if he has this money he doesn't have to live under the, the you know the the kind of whims of her father. Uh, he gets to be in independently wealthy, be his own man, so to speak. And then we realise that this actually is starting to put a, a further divide between the couple. They pack Hesse's body into the back of their camper van thing and uh, they drive off and they're getting lunch at a stop where these youths are there. These kind of biker youths are there and they obviously see Nero like pay with a, a big wad of money um, and they ask for money for, for supplies uh, and Nero very abruptly tells him to get a job and work for it as if you know he's worked for the money that he's got tells him to go and do it themselves and this leads to these kind of kids on their motorbikes terrorising them along the road driving further forward and putting a lot of oil on the road which ultimately leads to their vehicle going off and, and kind of cascading over. They steal the money from Nero's pocket, not knowing that there's two million dollars in the suitcase. Nero survives, but Eve is, you know, she's on death's door. And this is where we really see the maniacalness of, of the Nero character. He removes David Hess's body from the, the camper van, puts it in the car along beside his wife. Um, it basically dictates to her in her kind of dying breath that he was going to kill her anyway. He's been trying to formulate the plan. This is why they took the body with them. He was just trying to find a way to get things in a position where he could set up the death of his wife and move on. Um, and then we were we're kind of trundling at this point along towards the very very end, which is him setting fire to the vehicle and walking off uh, with the case full of money, uh, with the iconic final shot of him actually hailing down a vehicle to begin his hitchhiking journey. Very, very similar to how we were introduced to David Hess's character all along. Um, yeah, this movie's really good, actually. I think, like I say, it has some issues uh, in the way that Nero's character is really introduced. I think from the first time I meet him, I'm th I th personally thought he was quite a reprehensible, horrible guy. And to spend a lot of time with him and Hess, I started to wonder who was worse. And the movie continued along with that kind of playing off the, the two of them as just being these reprehensible alpha male sort of figures. Both of them wanting to be in control, um, but neither one of them really being in control of their themselves, really, which was, which was more the interesting part. There is no real likeable character here, and that's where I found it difficult to actually like hang my hat on anything in the movie. As it kind of went along, it was just a, an exorcism in depravity, um, in a way which, you know, was very lurid at times. I, I mean, it really does kind of pornographically focus 
on, you know, the violence of men against women. And I, I mean, I think I think it's handled well, but maybe could have been. And it speaks of the time as well. I'm very much aware of the genre, etc. Um, you know, and you know the, the the origin of the movie, where it's coming from. I I just thought like at times I, I wasn't sure who I was supposed to be rooting for in this movie, and as a result, when it got to the end, I kind of felt like we just followed a whole lot of reprehensible characters who ultimately killed each other off. To get like almost like a, a villainous Highlander, you know what I mean? There can be only one, um, and I thought that was quite interesting. I thought the the cinematography is beautiful in the movie. The originally, according to factoids on the internet, they originally wanted to shoot this in um, California, but it was going to cost too much. The movie's supposed to be set in Los Angeles, but what they end up doing is they ended up shooting it in Italy. Uh, as a way to kind of piggyback on that and to be honest it doesn't feel like that removed from I mean I, I know very little about you know the, the Californian hills that it could very well be for all I know um, very similar maybe some people have been out there and think you know the setting's well off it's not you know overtly obvious that it's shot in a different country you know it's not like watching something like pieces for example and like oh yeah this is boston and you're watching it going this is not boston this is clearly spain um so i thought it was good the ennio morricone soundtrack or score to the movie is phenomenal lovely really kind of adds a weight to it I've, I've read a lot of reviews about the movie that say you know you could be mistaken for thinking this is a spaghetti western and I see where they're coming from with that one, the, the particular palette of the, the way it's shot, the, the Morricone score, obviously, most notably known for a lot of those Spaghetti Western scores, uh, as well as just, I think, the some of the dialogue at times feels a bit headier than the content you're seeing. And I feel that with a lot of um, Spaghetti Westerns at times, that sometimes the dialogue is like, I don't know why we're having this conversation between two gun-wielding banditos, uh, but you know we're gonna do it here and that's you know that's just the way they've decided to write the script and it kind of follows this way as well uh, I don't think it's in terms of the movies we've watched thus far in the collection it's at the top tier but it certainly was an interesting first time watch for a movie that I'd never you know even heard of before and that's the exciting point from maybe my perspective uh, specifically in the, the Italian collection is there are so many movies in this collection I've never seen before and some of them I have heard of but there's a whole rung of them that I have never heard of before so this was one of these ones where I was like I'm glad that I finally watched this one uh, Franco Nero is you know as the, the kind of well he played Django and well, he was in Django and um, you know when you're watching those movies like he, he still has that look about him of this kind of shifty, tired, maybe potentially villainous sort of guy. Um, you're watching it as well and you can't quite work out why this couple's married at all because she is absolutely gorgeous um, and she doesn't appear to really like uh, Walter as a character, Walter Mancini. Um, she doesn't like him at all. Uh, she finds him repulsive uh, for, for the most part. So it's interesting to see that combination and how they interact with each other, which is, and the description for, for the movie, they say a bickering couple. Uh, I would say it's more than that. I would say it's a, a, a marriage that has not existed long, but is, is kind of fueled by hatred. Um, and uh, listen, uh, I'm not there to judge anyone's relationship. So yeah, I think this is one that you should check out for sure. I think it's in terms of the collection, it's a very interesting shift in tone if you're going through them. It's been primarily, uh, you know, horror movies up to this point, and now we're switching off to, to the side of a crime thriller. Uh, and there's certainly more kind of crime thrillers and, uh, you know, police pr procedurals in the collection coming up. So, yeah, I, I did. I thought it was really, really good. If I had to give it a Netflix grade, uh, one through five, one being hated it, two being didn't like it, three being liked it, four is really liked it, and five is loved it. I would probably come in about 3.5 for this one. Like I say, I think there's there's certain elements that have not aged particularly well. I think the the kind of setup of the Franco Nero, you know, Walter Mancini character is right from the off with you know with, within the first three minutes, he's kind of trying to rape his wife in the back of a car. And I'm not entirely sure if that's what they were aiming for 
or you know it's just that there's a you know a lost in translation thing of oh she's playing hard to get but even then you know looking at through 2018 eyes you know the, the the film has some issues there which happen right at the beginning and then the movie tries to play it down until the end where we realize he is actually this really horrible reprehensible character i got that a couple of minutes into the movie so something very difficult to hang my hat on when horrible things the only one i felt sorry for was his wife in the, the, the entire movie is she's between a rock and a hard place from the start of the movie to the end and then dies horribly and i just think there's something maliciously you know something maliciously brutal in the way that a story like that is told where there is nothing nice to happen to this character at all she's brutalised by men all the way through and then dies I think it's unnecessarily mean um, but not in a way where like I say it put me off watching the movie it's still a, a kind of 3.5 for me it's one I would recommend and it looks beautiful it sounds amazing and it has some really good performances David Hess is like you could argue David Hess is playing a character he's you know typecast with but he's really fucking good at it uh, and Franco Nero's really good in it uh, and Col Corinne Celery's really good in it so I just think across the board you get a lot of great performances uh, the story could have just been a bit better uh, and it's a little bit predictable um, maybe not necessarily from 1977 but in today's climate it just felt a bit more predictable.